The road from Manali to Leh is one of the Himalayas' ancient trade routes. Collectively, they're called the Silk Road, but it was always a network with alternatives. Some routes went from China to Europe, and others went south into India. For journeys to China, the Manali Leh route was less popular than the Srinagar Leh route because it was too high, too long and too dry. The road is still pretty empty, but has a wide range of users and retains the camaraderie of the road, which makes speech so far more free and conversation so much more interesting as a traveller wrote in 1928. The users include bikers on Royal Enfields, ultra-tough cyclists, pashmina goats, sheep, road workers, horses, commercial trucks, army convoys, pedestrians, and tourists. Some parts of the road are well paved and others are hellish, just as the weather in the dark can be beautiful or hellish. This video was taken travelling north by car in September 2014 from Manali to Leh. Before the road was built, the 475km trip took about 20 days. Now, you can do it in a single day as a cannonball run, but this is not a good idea. It's like bolting your food in a five-star restaurant. Starting in Manali, this video looks at the history and character of the areas through which the road passes. Calvert, a geologist, wrote in 1873 that at Manali, the view of the snow-covered mountains shows the regular stratification of their formation and contrasts well with the rich tints of the splendid Deodar forests beneath, the prime of which are being annually cut down and launched into the river to float down to the plains for the constant demand for railway sleepers. Eventually, the forests were protected by Duff Dunbar, a Scots forester. Today, Manali is known as the honeymoon capital of India. Vashist, three kilometers from Manali, is famous for its hot springs, its German bakery, its old houses, and its backpack community, remembering the hippie days. The Solang Valley, 
14 kilometers from Manali and 600 meters higher, is a good place to sleep if you need to acclimatize to the altitude. In summer, it's a center for paragliding. In winter, it's a ski resort. The old village is over the river Bias and up the hill. The road north from Manali goes over the Rotang Pass. Its name means pile of corpses, with most of the deaths caused by sudden storms. Warm air from the south meets cold air from the north, producing heavy snowfalls. As Fraser wrote, if human beings happen to be there during the process, they are transfixed by the cold. In October 1869, 70 men were caught in a storm and died on the Rotang Pass. A mythical king is said to have made the pass with a single blow from his magic hunting crop. A second blow would have made it lower, but a goddess restrained him, so that the Hindu people from the plains would not mix with the Buddhist people of Lahore. The idea no longer works. Beyond the Rotang, one finds the mystic valleys of Lahore and Spiti with their lofty crag formations, magnificent snow peaks and glaciers. Fraser wrote in 1907 that Lahore is bounded on one side by a curtain of rock which I cannot but think must have no parallel in the world. At the bottom flows the Chandra River. Here, a grey rushing cataract swollen by water from the melting ice. It's also the place where, in 1863, the eighth Earl of Elgin died of a heart attack 
while crossing a bridge over the river. Growing seed potatoes brought prosperity to the Lahore Valley. Cold conditions make them free of pests and diseases. northeast and there is a filling station with a compelling advertisement. The next petrol pump is 365 kilometers ahead. So fill up. Keelong has the slightly depressing air of a town which lives off penny-pinching tourists. But when you get away from the main streets and the motorbike repair shops, you find a dramatic valley with small fields, flowers, children, cows and snowy mountains. Until the Rotang Tunnel opens, Keelong will remain shut off from the outside world, except for the four and a half months when the road is open. After Keelong, the road follows the dramatic gorge of the Baga River. As you travel north, the scenery changes from small green fields, trees and flowers to a barren desert with an arid flora. Darcha is at the confluence of three rivers, the squalor around the tea tents contrasting with the scenic magnificence of the riverscape. It's the last settlement before the arid tract of the road from Manali to Leh. Dr. Gerard in 1831 wrote that in crossing this lofty ridge, the wind blew piercingly on one side, while the sun's rays were scorchingly ardent on the other. The extremely thin, dry and cold air checks the vital energy with fearful rapidity. Deepak Tal is said to be one of the last unpolluted water bodies in India. Suraj Tal is the lake of the sun god, the source of the Bhaga River and the 21st highest lake in the world. The Baralacha Pass in 1907 was impassable to horses and travellers were told to hire coolies and coolies with coolies to carry food and more coolies to carry blankets and prayer wheels and cooking pots and the devil only knows what else.
wildflowers can be found in places, with the aridity of their location giving them a special brilliance. Sarchu was described as a camping ground in old books and on maps. It's now used by tourists. A giant rock called Phalang Danda marks the boundary between Lahore and Zanskar. Isabella Bird wrote of Sarchu in 1894 that the glacier blue waters tumble along in a deep, broad gash. Further on, to a lateral torrent, which is the boundary between Rupshu, tributary to Kashmir, and Lahore, or British Tibet, under the rule of the Empress of <laughs> India, Queen Victoria. Moorcroft, in the 1830s, crossed the Lachalung Pass and met a party of Lahuli Tatars with about a hundred horses returning from Leh, whither they had carried the goods of a Kashmiri trader. Most of the cattle had been overloaded and were bruised and wounded in the withers. Pang is on the edge of a gorge. It is a river with clear water and what claims to be the world's highest army transit camp. The Moray Plains are popular with bikers for their long straight stretches and complete lack of buildings. Rupshu is part of the Changtang region and is inhabited by the nomadic Changpa people. They live in yak hair tents and make their living from herds of sheep and pashmina goats. During the long frozen winters, both men and women become weavers. Isabella Bird wrote that, I had thought Ladakh windy, but Rupshu is the home of the winds.
At 5,359 meters above sea level, the Taglang La is claimed as the world's second highest motorable pass. The Gaia River runs in a deep ravine and accommodates the first settlements since leaving Lahore. The character is quintessentially in the Daki. Upshi is a transit town on the north bank of the Indus. Karu is a very large army camp. Shay lies in what Janet Rizvi calls the heart of Ladakh's heartland. A great stupor field testifies to its former importance. Shay was the capital of Ladakh before the 9th century and again in the 16th century. Its fort, palace and gompa had a commanding position with high mountains to the north and a large artificial lake to the south. Part of it survives. It's a place with many trees and rich agricultural land. <laughs> Tixe Gompa was founded by the Gelug or Yellow Hand. Buddhist lineage in the 15th century. It's often compared with the Potala in Tibet. Mato Gompa was founded by the Sakyapa Buddhist lineage, its name meaning many happiness. Each of the three monasteries was built as a castle to protect its treasure from foreign raiders. They now gaze at each other across the Indus Valley in friendly rivalry. The Druk White Lotus School stands beside Shea's fantastic stupor field. The school became famous when used as a set in the Three Idiots Bollywood movie. It's now making what must be the world's highest garden. At 3,400 meters, it is 900 meters higher than the Betty Ford Alpine Garden in Colorado, which claims to be the world's highest garden. Druk means dragon, and the school is therefore making a dragon garden. It's Buddhist influenced, sustainable, very much of its own time, and yet based on a classical Tibetan mandala pattern. Leh is the present capital of Ladakh and retains the character of a great Himalayan trading centre. Though damaged by the burgeoning army camps 
and ribbon development on its fringe. Central Lay undertook a beautification scheme in 2014, but still has some charming back streets.